Shalom. Today we are continuing the series of What's in a Name. Today we will be discussing the name of Elijah Eliyahu. We remember that there are so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. In other words, everything that is written in the Bible, all the words, including the names, are important. Elijah's name is made up of two Hebrew words, the first being El, which means God or strong or mighty. Some people call it the elevated one. And the rest of his name is Yah, yud which is an abbreviated form of the four-letter name of God, yud heh vav -He. We first meet Elijah in 1 Kings 17. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahav, Ahab, As Yahweh God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. When we look at this phrase, the Tishabite, from the inhabitants of Gilead, we see that the word Tishabite and the word inhabitants is the same word. So perhaps there is a place named Tishbi, or maybe he's just one of the inhabitants among the inhabitants of Gilead, Gilad. We see a map where, uh, where Gilead is along the Jordan River. We'll talk more about that in a minute. One of the notable things about Elijah is that his tribal identity, his parents, are never mentioned. This has been noted by the rabbis. Mention must also be made of a statement which, though found only in later Kabbalistic literature, seems nevertheless to be very old. In other words, the only place that they actually find this concept in Jewish writing is in the Kabbalah. However, I am not advocating the study of Kabbalah. It's just to be made known that even as early as the 4th century, Epiphanius had noted that Elijah might have been, in fact, an angel in human form, and he had neither parents nor offspring. So the point here is that we do not know what tribe he was from. We do not even know if he was, in fact, an Israelite, only that he was among the inhabitants of those who lived in the area of Gilad. The area is laid out in Deuteronomy 3, 12, and 13. And this land which we possessed at that time for our heir, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, I gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argov, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Uh, here it's Rephaim. So if he lived among those people, perhaps, and it is, and it is considered in other places that perhaps he was of the tribe of Gad, or maybe he belonged to the Reubenites, or maybe the half-tribe of Manasseh. The point is that he lived among the ten tribes which were first carried off into captivity about 720 or so before Yeshua came. Now something very significant happened at Gilead, and this is where Jacob and Laban parted from each other, but first they made a, a covenant there, which is documented in Genesis 30, verses 50 and 52. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. And, in fact, the name Gilead, or Gilad, Gilad, means the heap of witness, the pile of witness. So this is the pillar that will be the witness because nobody else is there to view their covenant. Now, Laban and Jacob are making an agreement that they will stay to marry within the tribe, within that family. And this is something that has become very strong in, in the culture of the time and continues down even until today. Of course, it is a, a biblical commandment that we should not be unequally yoked. But before that was ever spoken, there was this, this covenant made to marry within the family, within the tribe. 
When I was teaching English as a second language, probably about 15 years ago, maybe 20, I had a student in my class who was Ukrainian, and she spoke with the other Russian students in Russian. And then one day I found out that she had actually come from Ukraine to Israel and had lived there for about 10 years before coming to the States. So I began to speak with her in Hebrew. And so I went many times to her house and just tried to be in a relationship and a friendship with her. Culturally speaking, these people were far from being anything Jewish. When I came around the winter holidays, their apartment was filled with Santa dolls and trees and similar decorations. I asked this woman who was in my class, had she ever been to synagogue? And she said, no. In fact, she'd never seen a Bible. And I said, well, how many generations back was it that the last time anybody went to synagogue? And she told me that her grandmother had been to synagogue. And she herself was probably in her early 40s. Eventually, in talking to the family together, the husband told me that when it comes time to marry, they begin to ask around who are the Jewish people in the community, and they deliberately choose to marry within the Jewish community, which is all to say that it appears to be a very strong cultural ethic to continue to marry within the family. So in that sense, there is some preservation of certain cultural values. The rabbis take note of this continuation of the line in this way. Rav Asi said, Nowadays, if a Gentile should betroth a Jewess, there is reason for regarding the betrothal as not, therefore, invalid, for he may be a descendant of the ten tribes, and so one of the seed of Israel. Now concerning Elijah, it is written in Sirach, which is part of the Apocrypha, in chapter 48, verses 1 through 3, Then Elijah arose, a prophet like fire, and his word burned like a torch. He brought a famine upon them, and by his zeal he made them few in number. By the word of the Lord he shut up the heavens, and also three times brought down fire. And then in verse 10, At the appointed time it is written, You are destined to calm the wrath of God before it breaks out in fury, to turn the hearts of parents to their children, and to restore the tribes of Jacob. See a parallel idea in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Concerning the book of Sirach, uh, I would have liked to have given my own uh, translation. However, this is the uh, original copies that are available, but you can see that they are written in Hebrew. So Elijah is often considered to be the prophet of the Ten Tribes, or what's called the Lost Tribes. He is particularly beloved of the B'nai Israel, who are, who are now known as the Jews from India. Most of them have, in fact, uh, made Aliyah to Israel. The Sha'are Rachamim Prayer Hall and Community Center for Indian Jews in Israel is housed in a grand three-story building on Harav, Raphael, and Kove Street in, in Springtzak, neighborhood of Haifa. It is located near the cave of Prophet Elijah, Mount Carmel. This place is of spiritual and religious importance to the Indian Jewish community. The community, even still in Israel, do not consider themselves to be B'nai Yehuda, the sons of Judah, they consider themselves to be B'nai Israel, in other words, sons of the lost tribes of Israel, of the ten tribes. It is noted that Elijah is very zealous for the covenant of Yahweh, 1 Kings 19.10. And he said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, in Hebrew that is Brit, thrown down thine altars, and slay thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Again, we see in Malachi that before the day of the Lord, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, this is Ha'adon, 
the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of hosts. Elijah appears in several important Jewish traditions. One is at Havdalah. Havdalah is at the end of Shabbat, on Saturday night as the sun goes down. There are several rituals that are done privately in the home. There is the lighting of a candle, the smelling of the spices, and a song is sung about Elijah. And these are the words of the song. Eliyahu Hanibi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu Hagiladi. Elijah the prophet, Elijah of Tishbi, as we talked about before, Elijah of Gilead. May he soon come to us along with Messiah, the son of David. So the pairing of Elijah and the coming of Messiah is together in this song. I guess at the close of Shabbat, people expect the Messiah to come. Maybe it's too much work for him to come on Shabbat. I don't know. Elijah also appears in the Passover Seder. There are traditionally four cups of wine, and they are based on, supposedly, this two verses in Exodus 6, 6 and 7. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out, this is the first promise, from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you of their bondage, this is the second promise, and I will redeem you, the third promise, with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, this is the fourth promise, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The four cups, uh, as they're laid out in a traditional Passover Haggadah, in a Seder, the first is sanctification, the second is redemption, the third comes with the grace after meals, it is a cup of blessing, and finally the fourth one is Halal, the cup of praise. But there is also a fifth cup which appears on the table, traditionally, and this is the cup of Elijah. And at a later point in the Seder, Perhaps a young child will be sent to the door to open the door for Elijah. And that same song is sung that uh, he may come soon with the coming of Messiah. It turns out that there is a fifth promise following the other four in Exodus 6, 8. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning that which I swear to give to you, Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a heritage. I am Yahweh. So the cup of Elijah seems to be connected to the people coming into the land, as it is written in the book of Sirach, that he is the one who will return the tribes, apparently coming from the tribes and then returning the tribes to the land. The actual origin of Elijah's cup goes back to a dispute of rabbis as to whether, after the four cups of wine, a fifth cup representing God's future redemption should be drunk at the seder. In their opinion, Elijah will answer all such questions with his arrival just before the coming of the Messiah. So when do the people actually go back into the land? We find that the beginning of Ezekiel 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And you know the story how the Spirit of God comes, he breathes over the bones, and he knits the people back together. And then later it says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathens, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. They shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. So we know that Elijah is coming again at the end of time. He, his coming precedes the coming of Messiah. It appears that he is the prophet to the ten tribes, and he will have a distinct role in reuniting them. After the bones are drawn together, Yahweh says the bones are the bones of the whole house of Israel. And then he gives the instruction for the two sticks to be joined together. And then he says, 
He will bring the people into the land, and they have, shall have one king and one God. To understand all of this, I suggest that you read the entire Ezekiel 37. We are very excited to see the beginning signs of this fulfillment of prophecy, but always remember that the occurrence of the event will answer all your questions. Until next time, Tasimita Inayim Al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption indeed is drawing nigh. Shalom.